Thank you for joining us today. We begin with our land acknowledgement, <clears throat> which reads, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. We're grateful for you joining uh, our um, dialogue uh, this afternoon. I am Paul Buckley, uh, Vice President and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Fred Hutch. And so we welcome you. Uh, welcome to the first dialogue for the AA uh, NHPI communities, uh, the Asian, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and Native Hawaiian communities. Um, this dialogue is entitled Solidarity in Diaspora, Experiences, Reflections, and Healing. And as part of the Public Art and Community Dialogue Program, uh, sponsored by the DEI Corps, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Corps at Fred Hutch, um, in close partnership with the Marketing and Communications um, Unit at Fred Hutch as well. These conversations, these dialogues that we are engaging with communities will ultimately shape how our selected artist um, for this installation represents our commitment to and our solidarity with the Asian, Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities and the commissioned art that will be produced. As an overview of our program, uh, uh, we want to again share with you that Fred Hutch is taking an, uh, an authentic, affirming and active approach to sharing the message that Black, Indigenous, and all people of color, as well as other minoritized and underrepresented people matter to us in our science, in our care provision, and in our community and beyond. Driving the strength and uh, the driving strength and motivation of this program is our interest in deepening our institutional community relationships. And one of the best ways to, to pursue that is through dialoguing with communities um, to hear, to listen, to deeply understand and um, act on a deepening, uh, a deepened understanding of what the communities are experiencing and what they wish for. Uh, the program will provide opportunity for the selected artists um, from each installment in the Public Artist Art and Community Dialogue Program to connect, to explore or align with each other and representatives from Fred Hutch to inform the final commissioned work and future community initiatives. These art installations that we are doing uh, will serve to engage other underrepresented communities as well and create broader and connected messages of solidarity. So at this point, I'd like to pass this over to uh, my colleague in the DEI Corps, uh, Dr. Joe Unko, who is Associate Director for DEI Learning client services and data analytics. And uh, they will talk about dialogue. Joe. Uh, thank you, Dr. Buckley. Um, so, you know, as we're thinking about these dialogues, which we are about to embark on our first one here, um, we really look at these as an opportunity for employees and the broader Seattle community to be in dialogue about community solidarity and our pursuit of equity in research and healthcare. So today, our dialogue will center around lived experiences, reflections, and aspirations for holistic and sustained health. These conversations, as Dr. Buckley mentioned, will inform our commitment to inclusion and how we represent that commitment in a visual and representative form. Uh, so I'd like to take a moment now to um, simply uh, thank our artist selection committee members, uh, Babasha O'Byrne, April Randawa, 
Byron Yi and Thierry Chim for helping uh, guide us in this work. We also encourage uh, the community that is joining us here today, so all of you lovely uh, attendees, to send in questions through the chat for our panelists, and we will monitor those and also um, highlight those as we go through our conversation today. Um, back to you, Dr. Buckley. Thank you so much, Dr. Onko. Um, <clears throat> I now have uh, the distinct honor and pleasure to uh, introduce um, to all of you our selected artists. Um, their name, her name is Sayare Rafai. Welcome, Sayare. Sayare uses they, them, and she, her pronouns. Um, they are a Chinese Iranian artist based on the traditional lands of the Puyallup and Coast Salish peoples referred to as Tacoma, Washington. Uh, their favorite mediums include community murals, printmaking, drawings, and poetry. And they strive to utilize art as a means of community building, education, and healing. In 2020, Sire became a member of Just Seeds Artists Cooperative, a transnational decentralized network of artists committed to social, environmental, and political engagement. You can find out more about their work at www.justseeds.org and search the artists. Um, and their name, Sire Rafai, or um, on Instagram at Sai, S A I K I C K, Psychic. Uh, I like that. Nice, 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 Sire. Psychic, not sidekick, because Sire is absolutely not that. And um, all this information will be in the chat if it's not already. Um, and you can see here some examples of Sire's previous work. Sire, Sire, we are so excited um, to see what you will create based on our conversations. So um, let's uh, bring you uh, uh, more central uh, uh, to this Zoom room. Welcome, Sire. Great to see you. Great to have you with us today. And good to see you again. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Buckley. That really kind introduction. I'm very grateful to be here. And thank you all for and the rest of the Fred Hutch team that's been organizing this, this whole process very thoughtfully. And for all of the panelists today for taking time to, to share some of your thoughts and insights as well. I'm excited to um, learn and be in conversation with all of you today. Thank you, Sarah. Um, just wonderful to share space with you and thank you for your interest in the program, pursuing it. And um, uh, it was uh, an absolute pleasure um, and standout for us um, who are uh, a part of the selection committee to engage with you uh, to talk with you, to hear your thoughts um, and feelings about art and about um, the project that we are engaged in. Um, uh, such, such wonderful reflections that you offered um, during that process. And now um, we have a chance to um, uh, have uh, all those who are participating with us today to hear some of those thoughts and feelings. So I, I want to invite you to share um, some reflections that you have about um, this program, this project that we're engaged in, the Public Art and Community Dialogue um, program at Fred Hutch about art itself and um, in your process and how you think about um, uh, the mediums you engage uh, to, to move people. Those are my words, um, but perhaps you will share what it is that you pursue in delivering, um, creating and delivering your art. So the screen is yours. Thank you. Um, for me, the process normally starts with a question and that question is often, what is the story that needs to be told? 
And so that takes some research, that takes conversations, that takes getting to know the community where the art is going to be placed, right? Like I'm oftentimes working on things that will be public. I'm not going to um, hang them up on my wall, right? So I want want to make sure that folks can see themselves in, in that or be able to ask questions and have some type of reaction to what they're seeing. Um, I'm someone who's a, a pretty introverted and timid, and I think art has been a means for me to um, be a bit more vocal in a more visual way. And um, I see it as an opportunity, an educational tool, um, a way to connect with people um, when maybe language is a barrier too. Um, so those are some of the things that I think about in, in starting a project. Um, awesome, thank you. And why did you pursue this particular project? If you would share a few thoughts about that and then um, I'll ask Joe to, I'll turn it over to you, Joe. Sure, yeah, I had honestly never heard about Red Hutch before. A couple of friends had sent me messages online or the social media posts about it and said, you should look into this opportunity. And um, sometimes I have pretty low self-esteem, but when other people are encouraging me, I'm like, okay, they see something in me that I'm not seeing myself and I will go try try to just apply and see what happens. Um, so thank you to those friends who, um, some folks I haven't talked to in years, and they just reached out and, and forward the opportunity. Um, and, you know, for me, I was really curious about Fred Hutch in part um, because my dad was diagnosed with cancer uh, right after I graduated from college in 2014. And I was in the process of working on the Parkland Community Mural Project during that time. And, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. He was about to start treatment and he encouraged me actually to, to stay and finish. Um, I was trying to decide whether to go back home to Oregon or to stay in the Tacoma area. Um, and I had been curious to learn more about Tacoma having been in just my university bubble for a few years, but not really having a lot of opportunity to um, really understand the place that I had been in for a few years. And so a lot of his encouragement was saying, well, you have connections there and um, it may might make sense for you to try and stay there a little bit longer and see what comes of it too. So, you know, I think for him and my family to see me doing what I enjoy doing um, kind of during his process um, was motivation saying like, okay, I'm doing something that I enjoy doing and um, hopefully it will be received well um, by the community here. Um, and also knowing that like having a loved one who's been impacted by, by something that you all are researching, right, was really intriguing to me and wanting to learn more about what Fred Hutch is doing. Um, and I also used to work um, within a university diversity center, right, and equity DEI work is uh, what I used to do a bit of and, and still push in my current day job. Um, to some extent, and um, just curious to see how an organization is trying to do that um, through art and bringing community together. I'm really interested in process. And so um, for me, it was more of a learning opportunity, <laughs> see what you all are doing and how you're doing it. Um, and if I can, in some way, be able to create with all of you in a meaningful way, I hope, you know, I hope to be doing that with you all. So I'm grateful to be here and um, and just keep learning with you. I love that. Um, I, I just want to pick, pick up a couple of pieces that you were throwing down that I think um, reflect really well our kind of purpose here today. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, a phrase you said was around wanting to understand the place you're in, and that resonates so much with me as a child of immigrants, as a new transplant to the Pacific Northwest. Um, really, you know, I think all of us in our different ways want to try and understand the place we're in, and um, I'm really resonating with that. And your question around what is the story that needs to be told here, I think is something that I'm really looking forward to diving in um, with our panelists to start talking through. So 
um, if it's okay with you, I'm going to go ahead and transition um, to just say, I'm really excited to continue this conversation and this learning opportunity with our amazing panelists that we have joining us today. Um, in the spirit of community, I do want to highlight there's only uh, about 34 of us in this Zoom room. I would love to be able to see some of your faces. So if you are able to do so and turn on your video, um, you know, we want to be able to recognize the uh, folks who are sharing space here with us today. So um, please, if you're able to do that, attendees, please uh, activate your video so we can engage with you uh, visually as well. So um, at this time, I will uh, take a moment to uh, introduce our panelists who will be joining Syrae and I. Each panelist brings their own perspective and lived experience, and I'm excited to, again, learn more um, from you all in this uh, space that we're inhabiting together. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Jennifer Joy, uh, who is a program administrator for Fred Hutch's Office of General Counsel. She is half Taiwanese and half white American. Born in Taiwan and raised there through elementary school, Jennifer lived in Oklahoma and Iowa before making her way to Washington five years ago. She is a forever student of international affairs, a dedicated volleyball player despite being 5'4", and currently trying her hand at wheel throwing ceramics. Our second panelist is Byron Yi, uh, who is a uh, financial analyst with uh, the HIV Vaccine Trial Network, COVID Vaccine Prevention Network, um, and the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division, VID. Uh, Byron is a fifth generation Chinese American and grew up in California and Washington State. While he was finishing his Peace Corps service in Senegal, he was inspired and encouraged to move to China to search for his roots and learn Chinese. He ended up living there for four years, located the villages of his paternal and maternal ancestors, is now fluent in Mandarin, and attempts to speak and cook as authentically as possible with his family. Byron teaches and practices Tai Chi and yoga at his local YMCA and also writes poetry in his spare time. Our third panelist will be uh, Gita Beauchamp. Uh, Dr. Gita Beauchamp is a senior statistical analyst in the Statistical Center for HIV AIDS Research and Prevention, or SHARP. 40 years ago, she immigrated from Sri Lanka to the US with her parents and three brothers. She started working at Fred Hutch in 2001, soon after completing treatment for early stage breast cancer. Uh, Gita returned to school in 2017 to earn a doctorate from the Department of Health Services and Population Health School of Public Health at the University of Washington. Gita directed the ESL program at the Hutch from 2015 to 2017 and participated in the Hutch's Diversity Council. Currently, she is co-chairing SHARP's DEI committee. She is a Washington State Sri Lankan Tamil Association member and served as its president from 2014 through 2016. I also wanted to thank um, Mercy Lorino, Director of Cancer Genetics and Prevention, who agreed to be a panelist today, but was uh, not able to make it at the last moment. So I do just want to say thank you, Mercy, for your willingness to join in our community conversation today. Um, and on that note, welcome panelists. We are going to dive right in and talk about the big AAANHPI, Asian, Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, communities, um, the roughly 50 plus ethnic groups that make up Asian diasporas. Um, as we know, there is an immense diversity, nuance, and complexity among these communities, and they are far from monolithic. All of us are coming from different parts of the world, representing um, a huge um, a diverse set of um, individuals and populations. And yet, there can be a lot of shared experiences for our communities um, among those differences, especially as we become Americanized and in the US, US context. So I'd just like to open it up with um, what kind of reflections or reactions do you have to that statement? Um, do you see some, similar, some similarities, commonalities, or what kind of variations are you noticing as well in your experiences here? I can start, Byron, I see you unmuted at the same time. Um, Go ahead. Thank you, Joe, it's, it's great to be here. Um, in regards to your question, last night I sat down with my journal with my candles and I was thinking about this question and it's really a massive question, you know, AAANHPI and all that it encompasses. And there is a large difference between someone coming from a Taiwanese background, a Thai background and a Tongan background. Those are not 
the same experience at all. And I feel like, you know, if I interact with someone that has a Mongolian background or an Indian background, right, I get as much learning and cultural learning and difference as if I interacted with someone who has an Armenian or Colombian background, right? So to be grouped together is, is um, I think that's very specific to our sort of American context and American schema of thinking about this population and this racial or ethnic group. But to me in my lived experience, right, I was thinking about this and I was like, oh, I'm just one half Taiwanese person. Like I can't possibly know or represent this entire community and what it means to be within the AAA and HPI. Um, that being said, I do think there are also shared experiences. You know, I think there's a shared theme of migration and immigration. I think there's a shared theme of that relationship between the self and the family unit or community unit. And that can be a positive relationship or a tug of war at times. Um, and I also would venture to say there's definitely a theme of like good food and being very focused on food and providing food and having food being how you show care and welcome as well. So. I would like to tack on to Jennifer's um, response there and add that I think in the greater AAA and HPI community, um, what we do share is similar feelings, similar emotions, especially um, coming out of the tail end, hopefully the tail end of the COVID-19 pandemic. And also um, just in general, sharing similar aspirations, um, both in terms of what uh, you want as an individual, uh, maybe your obligations or your need to respect what your parents want or, or greater grandparents or ancestors want. Um, there's, especially in my background of, of going back and finding my roots, um, trying to maintain that sense of pride and how to maintain my family legacy and pass down that legacy to my own kids is something I, I think about quite constantly. And I, I feel like that's something that a lot of the greater Asian community thinks about or, or considers regardless of which country or which ethnic group you're coming from. Yeah, first, I want to thank uh, for inviting me uh, to participate in the panelist as part of the panelist. Uh, and also, most importantly, I want to thank uh, DEI Co for doing this art, P art project to unify communities and also to give visibility to the communities because we all connect with each other through emotions. And this, when we see the art pieces, uh, it makes patients, providers, and researchers at the at the heart seen and validated and it also helps unify us right so like jennifer mentioned that we are very diverse we speak over 100 languages among all our communities combined together and many religious practices so that i feel like it's a, a commonality uh, and yet um, not only within between the community but also within the communities there are differences from socioeconomic status to educational attainment, English proficiency, proficiency for the immigrants, new immigrants. And also first generation is very different from the second and third generations or future generations. And uh, the stereotype of course, uh, for all A, A and PI community is that you are um, model immigrant, right? Model minority, smart, hardworking from financially well-off families, uh, but we are very diverse. So I kind of think of us as like a quilt, beautiful quilt with different patches representing, you know, our cultures and as well as um, shapes, I guess. And um, the other thing I was thinking was that um, all of us, all our communities have experienced different traumas and discriminations from um, Japanese encampment to um, the anxiety felt by first generation, uh, future uh, other gener our children, second and third generations, even though they are American born, but they're perpetual foreigners. So that's a common experience for all of us. 
And then the one of the common other commonalities that we are like, I think Byron was mentioning, and we are more collective, our focus is more collective harmony rather than individualistic, like American tend to focus, no, Western cultures tend to focus on um, individualistic attainment and achievement. And so, like my mother would often say to me, that we are stronger uh, together. A bundle cannot be broken, but a stick can be broken. So, and the other thing that I was thinking about when it comes to health, that there's an increased level of uh, anxiety and depression and mental health issues in the last, it's increasing actually between age 15 and 24. That's the highest cause of death for that group. So we need to pay close attention to the effects to that age group, as well as when we do research and publish them together as a monolith, the cancer that affects each of the group is slightly different. So we need to see how, how we are collecting data for research as well as publishing it. Thank you all for sharing. I'm um, hearing so many things that I myself am resonating with. I didn't get to do a bio for myself. I'm Filipino American, uh, Filipino American. See, sometimes I forget my own gender. Um, so, you know, some things that I'm hearing that I resonate with. I, I love that we touched on kind of good food. Um, I also think of like food as medicine. And as we're sort of thinking about this and some other commonalities, again, this is a very kind of writ large um idea in my mind of like, I feel like a lot of our cultures or Eastern cultures, we also have different perspectives on health and medicine that I didn't see necessarily reflected in my health experiences here um, growing up. And, you know, my easy example is I get my COVID booster and I also make my ginger soup because that's what my mom, my grandma would do, right? Um, and we have these kind of inter interplaying relationships to how our culture is expressed in the American context or for someone like me who's American born, trying to understand how I relate to my home culture through this process of, um, I believe Gita kind of mentioned this, the like perpetual foreigner. I'm for I'm a foreigner in my own home country, right? And how do I understand my legacies and what does it mean to live in diaspora um, through that context? And you know, our individual diasporas have our own uniqueness, but I think there's something to that Americanization process that is shared, even though it comes from a different root um, as well. So um I'm going to kind of touch back on something that Byron sort of highlighted as we're kind of thinking through as we're coming out of the COVID pandemic and what that's meant. Um, you know, we have to acknowledge that during the pandemic, there has been and continues to be a surge in anti-Asian racism. I think this is one of those examples where there's a big monolith, right? People will say it was a China pandemic in quotes, but anyone who looks like me, I'm not Chinese, is also a target, right? And so there's, I think, a lot of that element there of the per perpetual foreigner that's coming up as well. So, um, you know, in light of that, there was also renewed focus on solidarity, activism, kind of mutual aid and support among our communities. So I'd like to hear if any of y'all had any of those experiences or if you have any ideas around what you think is kind of integral to strengthening that solidarity, building more unity. Again, acknowledging our differences and diversity, but we also have collective um, power, I think, as well. So um, what reflections or thoughts do you have around that? Um, I'll go first here to answer that with a just a brief um, personal story here. So um, during the pandemic, my wife went out with her, with our sons to a nearby playground and some random stranger just walked up and asked her, are you Chinese? And she was very hesitant on how to answer that, came back and shared that experience. And she was, um, there, there was a lot of different emotion, anger, hesitancy, defensiveness, um, because had you said, had she said, yes, how, how would that stranger respond? How she said, no, how would they possibly challenge that? Um, and so that, that inspired me actually to, to start writing poetry again. And I don't have time to share it today, but I think what that led to was, um, the fact that one of the key efforts to me at least was providing an open space for dialogue and for people in this greater Asian community to have a chance to share their feelings 
and just validate those feelings. Um, there is a stereotype in the Asian community that, um, or a lot of Asian community groups that like, you know, we don't speak up, we don't share our feelings, we don't share our emotions, we don't rock the boat, we don't make waves. At least that's how I was raised in my household. And so um, keeping all of that emotion inside it is incredibly stressful and painful. And so I think for me, having a chance to write that poetry, having a chance to engage in dialogue about my feelings and other people's feelings was incredibly therapeutic and um, encouraging that other people are feeling the same way. For me, again, this monolith, I think, is like, you know, created by dominant culture to, in some way, um, cause some erasure amongst our communities, too. And one group in particular I've seen um, over the last few years, um, Sudo for Solidarity, really show up for folks um, who are being detained. So, and, and Sudo is a Japanese, Japanese-American um, group based out of Seattle that um, works to educate folks about Japanese internment and also to end um, detention, deportation, right? So I'm, I think it's amazing to see groups of folks who've learned from, from the past and don't want to see it repeated again and recognizing some, a lot of the systems currently are replicating themselves. And so many of our various diaspora have been influenced by colonialism, by U.S. imperialism, by um, U.S. sanctions, right? So if we continue to see these patterns, um, I see unity in how we can continue to educate each other about the ways we've been impacted by these different systems and, and come together, right? Like our, our populations are the, <laughs> the most in the world if we actually um, um, we're able to use our voice and not have fear of of doing so. That's so much that we, I think we've been taught to um, to refrain ourselves from speaking up or saying bad things. Um, that a lot of change could happen, um, and I think we're starting to see that a lot more um, with the use of technology, with social media, and the ways that we're able to connect with so many communities all over. Um, but I see that as an integral part of continuing to educate and uplift and um, share those cultural complexities, um, but also challenge the ways that we've been brought up to, to not be expressive and to um, saving face and all of these things that are stereotypical to our own upbringings. So one thing I would say beyond the art project is that in, the, in, a, in a regular basis to provide the communities a um, chance to be seen is uh, one of the easy way, I think. It's like in the cafeteria or common gathering places, like for example, if it is Chinese New Year, have some Chinese decorations in the cafeteria, food, um, food serve some food related to that. Same with like, for example, Indian Diwali is uh, getting more and more recognition in the US and uh, that will help people, I think a chance to come together those days. And also to say, yeah, I matter, my background matters and I'm being seen, right? So that's just an example of unifying. Thank you for that. Um, Jennifer, I think I saw you unmute earlier. I wanna make sure yeah. you have space. Yeah, so Joe, your question was about the uptick in anti-Asian violence with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I was just thinking back to how my experience was during that time. And I think for me, you know, I remember being particularly aware of being Asian, right? Like when you're living your day-to-day -day life, it's not like your alarm goes off, you hit it and you're like, time to start my Taiwanese American day. You know, your alarm goes off, you hit it and you just get in the shower and you're you and you live your life. But I think during those, you know, first six months when it was really having an outbreak, I was very aware of how I was moving through our Seattle area or moving through life or how people might perceive me. So personally, there was just an extra awareness um, and bringing, bringing me back to that 
because of what was going on in community rather than like anything happening specifically internally. Um, but I also think that, you know, during that time I would hear some of my, my friends talk about how like, um, well, like they'll say like, oh, like you're Chinese, you have COVID, but like, I'm not Chinese, I'm Japanese. Or like, I'm not Chinese, I'm, I'm whatever. But I think that there is a very curious balance when we're trying to build solidarity, right? In knowing that there is the separation, but in the end, this is one struggle. So I think like people might tend to say like, oh, I'm not even like of that identity group, right? So like, haha, jokes on you. But in, in reality, you know, the external view of what's going on is that you are of that identity group. And in reality, like you are of that group, but you are also of one struggle, right? Like when there is something, some anti-Asian um, bigotry going on, that's not just an Asian issue. That is a societal issue. That is the one struggle we're all in. If there's something anti-Semitic, or Islamophobic, that's not just their issue. That is like a one society issue. So I think it's thinking about solidarity, there's a difficult balance in placing attention on a specific group that might be experiencing something at that point and giving them the love and empathy and support that they deserve for that specific um, ex instance that might be happening, but also retaining that this is these are all connected. We are, we are engaged in one struggle, so we should show up for everything while also paying a specific attention to whatever societal issue might be happening at that time and leaving space for it as well. I hope that made sense. Yeah, I, I'm personally resonating a lot with that. During that time, I was um, living in a rear, very rural part of the United States before moving here, and I was as you mentioned, sort of like this, like hyper vigilance, hyper aware of like, I'm so different. I'm the only Asian person I know in this area or in this community that I'm a part of. Um, and some things that I was thinking around with that solidarity piece, right, is like, I'm, I'm not Chinese, but my cousin was attacked, right? Like we had this whole um, aspect that you highlighted, I think that everyone sort of highlighted, it's how the other reacts to us and creates the monolith that we are separable, but we're also in this mutual struggle. Um, and one thing that I experienced or thought about thinking through the solidarity piece myself was the ways that we are intersectional solidarity, right? So I had a friend who is um, a really strong disability activist, and she was the only person in my team that checked in with me and said, hey, a lot of stuff is happening with Asian Americans. What can I do? So you don't need to be the one to tell our colleagues and educate our colleagues, like, let me drop off ice cream on your porch, because it was still COVID, so ice cream on the porch, and then we activate each other in our different areas. And I think that's something um, I'd like to hear a little bit more of as well as we think through like what's happening in our local communities here. Um, what have y'all seen as far as like um, the Fred Hutch connection to what's going on in AAA NHPI communities? What do you think it should be? How do we mutually support each other? Um, either, either in our local community, you know, hyper local at the Hutch or the Seattle region in general, what are some of these kind of bridges or interconnections that you're noticing? Um, and I did want to highlight one more item so we don't need to always just talk about COVID and trauma too that Gita brought up is like, how do we also celebrate each other? Like solidarity looks like a all of those things, right? Supporting each other when times are hard, but also celebrating each other in ways that showcase how we are still part of each other's communities, even though we are, uh, you know, as you said, kind of separable, but together. So what, what have y'all seen or what do you hope to see um, here in our communities? I could go again, even though I just spoke. I don't see anybody un un unmuting, so I'll just go ahead. So Joe, I'm taking your question, what is Fred Hutch's relationship to our wider Seattle and local Fred Hutch community? So I moved from Taiwan to Oklahoma at the end of elementary school. And then I spent seven years in Oklahoma and four years in Iowa before going off internationally and ending up in Washington. And I think that for those that might be from the area, you don't realize how awesome it is to have just this stronghold of Asian culture here on this coast. You know, this coast 
was blessed to be in proximity to Asia and to the Pacific Islands. And we have had centuries of migration towards specifically this coast first before going elsewhere, right? So, you know, I had this experience where I was in the international district, Chinatown, Japantown, whichever term you like to use it. And I was just meandering, I was putzing around. I didn't have any plan. And I walked into the sushi store called Maneki, not knowing anything about it. And it turns out that Maneki is a super old establishment that has been in operation in an international district for over 120 years, right? I'm sitting there, I'm talking to the owner. That restaurant was there before Japanese internment camps were opened. And the owners of that restaurant left Maneki, were forcibly displaced into the internment camps and then came back and continued the restaurant. And for someone who lived in Oklahoma and Iowa, right, to have it not be theoretical, right? Like Japanese internment is not theoretical textbook, something that happened, to, but to be in a restaurant in Seattle that actually had that history play out there, that was really special. And I think that, you know, we're in this city and in the state that has that privilege and that long legacy of history. So um, I'm, I think that Fred Hutch is doing the work to recognize that aspect. I, I was thinking about how, what connection do we have? And I was thinking that I think mostly for me anyway, personally, uh, in that work, it is through the significant contributions made by the patients, the clinical trial participants, the research that we do, and the researchers and staff in various capacities from as healthcare providers, as to, to mentors and, and in various capacities throughout Fred Hutch. And I, then I, but the work and the, and, we, and I overall, you know, we are quite happy working at Fred Hodge. And then we take that home to our communities. And I know for a fact, my children are very, my two grown daughters are very proud of the fact I work at the Hodge. And my parents are too, right? So I think um, Hodge making more effort to connect and unify our communities together, as well as you know, at the workplace itself and help us develop empathy and getting to know each other. And then we take that outside and propagate that. But then also when we do, um, do research and findings that we make sure that information gets to the communities if there are specific findings, right? So it's often it gets published, but it doesn't really reach to the general population. Um, highlight the fact that this is um, a discussion about public art and community dialogue. What I love about what the Hutch is sponsoring with these different um, public art pieces is that it sparks curiosity from people. Um, and everyone on this panel has mentioned like education is really important, but education is also extremely challenging to do. There's this really fine balance of, of sharing too much information, not enough information. I don't wanna be the guy who's just like, oh, there goes Byron again, rambling on about his adventures in China. Like no one wants to hear about that anymore, too much information. So what I love about art and specifically these installations is that there's an image and that sparks questions, hopefully, from the people who are viewing this. Oh, what does that symbol represent? Maybe I should Google that or I really love the colors and the choices on this. I really wanna see more of Sayari's artwork. Let's go to Instagram. Um, and so it's inspiring people to kind of seek out their own educational resources at the level that they're interested in. Um, so that's, that's why I really love how this program is designed and hopefully people are actually going out and, and initiating their own little self-discovery through this process. 
Yeah, I'm hearing themes around visibility and also really recognizing that we're in a space that has such a strong legacy and history um, for some of our communities here. And how do we increase that awareness, take what Hutch offers, propagate it in our home communities and vice versa, and just really building out or weaving more of them. Um, I think the quilt was a metaphor that came up, right? So how do we weave more of our quilt together? Um, we, uh, Sire, I wanted to touch base with you to see, are there any questions that are coming up for you that you'd like to ask our panelists as we go? And you can interject later if you need to process that for a minute, but. I mean, I could talk about food all day. I'm real curious. <laughs> I'm real curious from y'all's upbringing if there is um, foods that are or like traditions that, um, or practices that you grew up with um, that are healing, or um, I could give an example maybe. Um, like after a meal, my mom would always cut fruit up and that was just a practice to like help digestion and to like end the meal off. Or there'd be things that she'd tell me like more of that came off as like, don't do this, but it was really a lesson. So it could be like making sure that you cook tofu with ginger so that can balance the, the hot and cold properties of the food. Or, you know, at dim sum, you definitely drink the bole tea because that's like Drano and it'll help cut the, the grease of the, <laughs> the dim sum food. Right. Um, so just curious if there's things like that, um, that you've practiced or that you've learned, um, growing up. For me, um, the one that often comes in a rice and curry when we eat, uh, you may come across in some of the Western menu, it's called mulahu uh, It's a coriander and a few other spices together, boiled water, and it's very spicy and tasty. And we finish our rice dish at the end with some of that, or we'll drink it directly to help digest. And a lot of Indian, I'm Sri Lankan, so that's more common for me, but in the Indian culture, you know, um, yogurt is often served at the end. That's how they finish, like to finish their meal. And so there are some practices. Uh, but I have something that, Byron, what you said resonated with me. Right after I started, when I started researching Sire, I came across your piece, Illumination and Illuminating Becoming. I saw that piece that you put out connecting Diwali to that. So right away, I put it out on my Instagram feed for people to see and hopefully, you know, follow you. Yeah, I, I, I like your work a lot. Thank you so much. I have some thoughts about this food as medicine, sort of food practice, healing practices question of your IRA. Um, I think that absolutely, yes, there is like a long tradition of food as medicine in, in these like Eastern cultures, broadly speaking. You know, I have many examples of my mom just like not letting me eat mangoes. Mangoes are too cold. Like you cannot have more than half a mango at a time. And, you know, that was very annoying to me as a kid. And now I eat as many mangoes as I want. But um, that's absolutely a cultural practice, right? Like, what do you eat when you're pregnant? What do you eat when you're trying to get pregnant? What do you eat postpartum? What do you eat during certain certain seasons, right? Right now during the fall, I think you're supposed to eat more black foods, like black sesame and so on and so forth. Um, but I also wanna highlight, you know, this food as medicine reality and also Eastern medicine reality and stereotype, right? There's there's a double-edged sword to this. I think that a lot of the communities here in the US, they might practice that because they don't want to deal with the health system, right? They don't have access to the health system. They don't have health insurance. I didn't have health insurance until I went to college. So what happened when I got sick? Lots of ginger, warm pears with honey, right? So I think there is that reality where that is a long practice. And I do think it's like, I do think it works as well. However, I think the other side of that is that some of our perhaps more recently immigrated Asian native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities or those that are not as highly socioeconomic resource, right? They're using that as 
their way to health because they're not incorporated within the health system yet, or they have barriers in language and insurance. So I think there's both to, to that question. Um, Byron, if I may interject, um, we did get a question in the chat and I thought maybe you might connect some of these dots as well. So please feel free to continue on the food as medicine. Um, but we did get a question in the chat that um, uh, Diane would love to hear more about the health challenges in our communities, particularly around health disparities and cancer risk. So um, if you want to touch on that or we'll follow up with that. So Jennifer and Keita have that question in mind as our follow up question. But if you wanted to touch on that. Um, with any of your responses to Syrae's question as well. Before we, we dive into that, the, the one brief thing I wanted to answer on Syrae's question, I, I think there's, there's a theme that food is not just medicine, but food is incredibly valuable to our different communities and cultures. Um, it's not just a resource to provide calories. It is a resource to um, to enjoy with your family or a greater community um, as a social medicine. Um, and yes, all, all foods have, or a lot of foods have different medical implications and you should eat so much or not so much of these things at certain times. Um, but also just that, like I was saying that there's, there's value behind them. And so um, in, in my own family, like we practice being thankful for, for our food. So, Thank you to the farmer who spent all this effort growing these things, or thank you to the animal who sacrificed their lives so that we could enjoy this food and enjoy all the medicinal and social benefits of that. Um, so I think that that's just an overlying theme, not just pinpointing medicine specifically that I just wanted to highlight. So um, I'll go ahead and repeat the question from the chat around, um, learning more about health challenges in these communities, particularly around health disparities and cancer risk. And I'm going to add on to that also to add, what are some of your perspectives in our communities for what it takes um, to thrive in our healing, right? So not just the health challenges, but what do you see as like our aspirations for healing and um, really moving towards thriving, right? Just because we survive cancer doesn't mean we're in a position to thrive yet, right? So can we maybe link some of that um, as we think forward from there? And I think uh, it looks like Kita has unmuted, so please feel free if you're ready. Uh, actually, give me a sec. I have to find <laughs> That's that. okay. Actually, I found it. Uh, if I find it, maybe not. Sorry, go ahead. I did. Find, I do have some information, but go ahead. Somebody else answer it. Uh, Jennifer, you go first. I just spoke. Okay, we're all jumping in to cover each other's butts. Mm -hmm. um, Diane, I appreciate your question. I'm not, I'm not on the health side, whether in research or patient care, so I can't answer that, but I will answer Joe's question of sort of healing and thriving. I think that when I think of my wishes of health for the larger Asian Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community, what comes to my mind is mental health and intergenerational trauma and healing, right? I think that across the US and across the world, there is definitely a rise of of desperation and also attention to mental health. And specifically within the Asian community in my personal experience, I think there could be a lot more attention paid here because there is a massive generational gap in talking about these subjects, addressing them, medication for it and so forth. I think in, um, in thriving and healing, I, you know, my wish is for healing of intergenerational trauma. I think that for this group, right, we might have just a standard generational gap, there might be a language gap, there might be a geographic gap, and then there's a cultural gap. That is a lot to hold in your relationship with your parents or community or elders, and a lot gets lost. Um, so my, my wish centers on intergenerational healing. Yeah. So to the... Um, effect um, of the information on cancer, what I found was that um, AA and HPI community have high rate of stomach and liver cancers compared to non-Hispanic whites. And uh, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and South Asians have high rate of colorectal and lung cancer, especially among men. 
and native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders have 40% higher overall mortality compared to um, non-Hispanic whites. And so we do need to do the research to, first of all, collect the data, de-aggregate it, and then also publish it that way. But I understand why we can collect them because the numbers in non-Hawaiian -Hawaii, and Pacific Islanders are often small, so they not to make a meaningful data to come out that we tend to lump them together. But I think we are also doing some disservice in that. Uh, one of the things I thought about when you mentioned cancer, you know, kind of a cultural background, at least for me, when I first got diagnosed with breast cancer, my parents didn't want anyone in my community to know about it. In school, considered a black mark on our, in our family. So when people saw me with a very short hair, or almost no hair, they kind of looked at me strange and I tried to avoid it. people in my community, right? So that creates isolation. So we have to find ways to break through that stigma related to cancer. It's not a death sentence. Byron, do you have anything you'd like to add at this time? Okay. Um, I think in our, uh, this is, you know, tying it back to the work we do here at Fred Hutch in terms of cancer care and research, I think that's a great place for us to leave off. Um, you know, and the one other thing that I would offer kind of in response to what Jen Jennifer shared, right, when we're thinking about mental health, generational trauma, healing, we know chronic stress is also a risk factor, right? Like, so there's societal concerns in addition um, to whatever may be happening endemically as well. So definitely a nice place for us to launch off as we think to our next panel, which will be held on November 29th from 12 to 1. And I hope we'll see some of you there again to ask and build off of this conversation. Um, it is 12.59, so oof, I could keep talking forever, but I will just uh, close off here. I want to thank uh, you, Syre, for taking the time to join us and make a beautiful piece of art with us. Um, thank you to um, all of our panelists, Jennifer, Byron, Gita, and Mercy, who could not be here. Thank you to everyone who is in attendance today. Um, thank you again to our artist selection committee. I missed a name earlier, so I will say it all again. Uh, Bavasha O'Byrne, April Rondawa, Byron Yi, Terry Chim, and Jean Yi. Um, I'd also like to thank our partners in marketing and communication. And I hope to see you all at our next um, community dialogue on November 29th, which will be moderated by our amazing colleague and dedicated partner in moving DEI work forward, Tiffany Go. Um, have a great rest of your afternoon. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you again for taking your time to join us today.